So theological differences between Latter-day Saints and evangelicals are real and important and shouldn't be ignored. Sometimes hard feelings over these differences can get in the way of positive fellowship and friendship that might mutually lift us in a culture increasingly hostile to faith of all kinds. You've done work reaching out across other important differences between uh, different Christians and also with Catholics, and you've taken some heat for it. <laughs> yeah. Can you share more about why you feel this kind of interfaith dialogue is important yeah i think for me um i we live in a time where uh you know someone calls himself catholic it could mean anything or if they say they're jewish i have no idea you know based upon that individual we don't live in a time where people just go with a group um especially in the u.s where everyone prides themselves on free thinking. And um, so I've just found that I, I know what I've experienced with Christ and I know how good it has been to know him and to be known by him. And there's nothing more thrilling than those times when I know he hears my prayers and he answers me in the most ridiculous way. And so I want that for everyone. I want that security um, for everyone. And so if I have an opportunity to speak to someone who, who may be labeled something, I, that doesn't bother me. I just, I look at the individual and I go, God, help me love this person because I want him to know you. I want him to experienced a bit of what you and I enjoy, Lord. Um, and so if you call yourself Pentecostal, Foursquare, Charismatic Baptist, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter to me. I, I, I try real hard to just love whoever's in front of me and it, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Um, it's kind of funny, for, for a long time, I knew there was a video out there about you running into the missionaries, uh, Latter-day Saint missionaries, and I avoided it. Yeah. Because <laughs> I, I didn't want my feelings to yeah. be all colored at all. Yeah. And I'd seen so many other sort of dismissive, yeah. kind of like, ah, oh, yeah. those terrible Mormons. Yeah. So, I, I watched it only this morning thinking, well, I better. <laughs> and you were fine. You know, you brought up some stuff, but there are these feelings. And yeah, I have found in my conversations with some evangelical pastor friends that they just melt away. Hmm. Right? And I wasn't threatened anymore. And hmm. I found myself getting lifted and strengthened as a husband. Hmm as a disciple by them. So, hmm. um, yeah, I mean, those differences are are real and I'm sorry you've run into like maybe, um, and maybe the way I used to be, just maybe more abrasive, arrogant, um, just unloving when, the, you know, at the same time, it's like, gosh, I have to be truthful with my concerns. You know, you, you just, oh, gosh, when I read this book, it's all about knowing him, you know? And, yeah. and uh, it's just the fascination of Moses knowing God and Abraham being a friend of God and, you know, on and on and on. And, and then, uh, you know, the New Testament, so much about the grace of God and, and so whenever I talk to a, a Roman Catholic or Jehovah's Witness or, or LDS, you know, my concern is this, this working towards, this earning, where I, I totally believe that if the spirit is in us, we can't help but work. Uh, he moves us to work. But this, you know, when it gets off of grace and onto works, even with Baptists or whoever, I my 
my heart is just, oh, I want you to rest in him and know him. Because in the end, it's like, depart from me, I never knew you. There was no relationship. And yet sometimes, you know, people can come across uh, almost angry rather than concerned and i've probably done that as well um well no i uh, i don't think i felt that from you but i i stopped being threatened by that and i i started to get benefit from it and mm -hmm. i i found my evangelical friends were calling attention to things that could really benefit us you know mm -hmm. i found myself really relishing the different language that pastor grogan and urbana champagne would use when i would sit in his services so um the second question uh, your mother died at childbirth your stepmother <laughs> died when you were eight in an automobile accident your father died when you were 12 yeah it's fair to say you had many of the classic risk factors for a troubled teen <laughs> to give up on life let alone faith yeah but you didn't mm. so many young and old people are walking away from faith today mm including those raised in families of faith, saying essentially, who needs this to be happy? Mm -hmm. So uh, the question is, if you could speak with them directly, what would you say to those who are raised with encouragement to look to God, but who may not be feeling it anymore about mm -hmm. Jesus and starting to wonder if his message is even worth bothering with today? Yeah especially when compared to the immediate sexual and substance use excitement in the world around them. That's a really big question. <laughs> yeah, no, it is, it's, want to take it. it's huge. And I, I would agree with that person. Um, if there was no such thing as a judgment day, um, you know, but the scripture says it's appointed for a man to die once and then comes the judgment. Um, you know, in John, it says that he's given all judgment to the son. There's some pretty terrifying passages about, you know, this almighty God saying, depart from me, or these will go away into eternal punishment. And it's like, ah, um, I get it. There's, if, if the goal is happiness on this earth, um, yeah, go do your thing. Um, eat, drink, and be merry, you know, like, like Paul says, he goes, but I've, I've lived a foolish life if there's no resurrection from the dead, but because there is a resurrection, this is the why, this is the way I live. This is why I feel like a man condemned to die in the arena. And so, uh, you know, for too long, we've, we've tried to make following Jesus like, oh, it's fun. It's great. And it's really not the way the Apostle Paul described it. He says, if there's no resurrection, then I'm above all most to be pitied. Um, and when you read his resume of everything he suffered, um, you understand. You go, wow, that would be foolish if there was no eternity. So, so absolutely, if there was no eternity, um, yeah, go do your thing. But I just think we live in a time where even in the church, People are afraid to speak about the wrath of God, which is all through the scriptures, beginning to end. And, and it's, that, it's that terrifying reality. Um, but because people don't want to speak about it and they think it turns people off, um, people are starting to believe there is no judgment anymore. So that's the direction I would go for someone saying, hey, I tried it. Um, but now here's some temptation. I go, gosh, this is the same trap that Judas fell into. And you're going to find yourself holding a bag of coins or a woman or whatever and go, I just traded knowing the son of God for her mm -hmm. or for this or mm -hmm. for him. It's just it's it's uh it's not a good trade-off my wife and i were laughing the other day at your um one of your sermons where you said so are you saying am i saying that you're going to be punished one day of course yeah. not <laughs> script the, the bible does. yeah yeah 
Um, yeah, there's just people are not reading the Bible anymore. I mean, for 2000 years, you've had people devoted to this. And now we live in a time when people have stopped reading it and they just try to listen to catchy, you know, sermons here or there rather than just reading it for themselves, you know? Yeah. Well, that, that's a good segue to the next question. You recently said in a sermon, it's so rare to find a teenager who can pray, who can be alone for 10 minutes and try to focus on God and not have their mind wander because your minds are going so fast because of cell phones. This thing has just triggered us to constant stimulation. You close your eyes to pray and you have so many thoughts going through the mind. Can you say more about that? including maybe what you've done in your own home to counteract this influence and help your, your, ch your own children be ready to connect with God? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not easy, um, especially when the pressure is out there and you feel like you're that dad that has these unfair restrictions and none of the other kids have to deal with. Um, but it's, it's more like I tell my kids, like I'm I'm losing you, like, uh, just slow down. Your mind is going so fast. Um, in First Peter, it says, the end of all things is at hand. Um, so be sober-minded and self-controlled for the sake of your prayers. So we have to exercise self-control uh, that we can't have our mind just jumping from one thing to the next and then expect to have a good strong prayer life where you can actually focus on him and actually sense him being in the room ministering to you and where he answers you because you're focused on him and there's this this love and uh i just see this next generation so bad at relationships with one another and uh, it's like in psalm 42 7 when it says deep calls out to deep it's like the depths of my soul crying out to almighty God from this deep place. And yet, you know, texting and TikTok and it is so shallow. Um, and the church is starting to follow suit where shallow calls out the shallow because it's just easier and um, you can get it over with faster. And so, you know, I mean, this last summer, I just, told my kids we need to just get away uh, let's go away for two weeks no cell phones no computers I just want to be with you I want you to be with God I want us just to enjoy each other just trust me you'll, you'll be fine you'll live through it I'll live through it and I, I you know every parent's got to do their own thing I I have a friend who's pretty wealthy baseball player and he he told his high school kids, he said, uh, if you guys will stick to a flip phone, I'll buy you any car in the world that you want. So if through your high school, you know, because the moment you turn 16, I give you a flip phone and we go to any car lot and I'll buy you any car. But the moment you go to a smartphone, I take the car back and you're on your own. <laughs> Just because he hated, you know, seeing his kids uh, addicted to this and and so I, I think there's creative ways and different things we can do, um, but it's a real fight if Satan can get us just doing a bunch of stuff and not really knowing Jesus and being known by him, uh, he wins. Thank you. Yeah. You talk a lot. And one of our favorite things about that you taught us is you, the way you phrase it is that spending alone time with God. And as we've been talking, that's harder to find, even for those who want to. I was curious to know if you found time alone with God harder to preserve in your own life with all these intrusions and distractions. We always talk about the kids. If yeah. so, what extra steps have you taken to protect that time? Yeah, uh, I think the difficulty for, you know, everyone has their own weaknesses. For me, I'm a, I like to achieve things. I like to get things done. And we live in a time where you can get a lot of things done, big things done in five minutes. And so the temptation is, let me do this, let me do this, let me do this, just 
you know, making split second decisions without really praying them through, um, believing things without really studying them um, diligently. And so it's, it's a fight for me. Um, I have to wake up and, and say, no, I'm not going to see who called. I'm not going to see what's waiting for me. Um, sometimes I just put, you know, my earbuds on and go out for a walk and pray and just have, you know, even like instrumental music blocking out all the noise out there and just talking to him and thanking him and worshiping him. Um, it's just, uh, but it's, it's self-control. Like the Bible says, you, you have to be self-controlled uh, in order to be able to pray. And so self-control is, I want to check my messages. I want to see how many things I need to get done today. Um, but I refuse to, because this is, this is really the only thing I have to do. Mm. Love that. Mm. You are probably busier than most. Mm. In addition to your teaching and traveling, you've got seven kids of your own, some married, a few still at home. Yeah. Uh, we've been talking a lot in our faith community about worship opportunities at home. And not just, not just going to another building for that. What has worked well in your own home for you and your sweetheart to get the message of Jesus into the hearts of your children? Um, yeah. Just curious to share what lessons you learned about that. Yeah, we've never been ones to have like a set time um, to talk through like scripture. And, I, and that's a wonderful thing. And I, I wish I'd been more diligent in that but for us it's really in the context of everyday life and the kids have seen the decisions we explain the decisions we make with the kids we go hey this is why dad gave this money away this is why we're moving to this area this is why this and it's really not what I want to do but I know this is what God has called me to do and then they see the result of it and they marvel going I, I, I'm telling you just watch he listens. He's, he's been listening to me ever since I was a kid, ever since I was your age. And, 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 and I, I want you to see this. Um, and so my kids now that are grown, they, I, I remember telling my girls, I go, look at the way this one situation worked out. I go, this is why I want you to marry someone who knows God, because you're going to miss out on all of this. If you just marry someone who says, he's a Christian or whatever else. It's, it's not about that. And um, I remember one time uh, my daughter had brought a boyfriend home and, and I had some friends that were in town and, and they told me afterwards, they go, yeah, we talked to your daughter and asked her how serious she was with this guy. And they said, she gave the weirdest response. She says, yeah, I'm just hanging out with him. And I just want to see if God listens to him. And they're like, what is that about? And I go, I know exactly what she's saying. She knows that God listens to dad. And she knows that I know him and he knows me. And so if she's going to get serious with a guy, she wants to see that same evidence that you're not just a religious person doing these things and, um, looking good and sounding good and but i want to see that you're known by god and when you pray crazy things happen because that's all i've known about my dad and so it's more in the context of life versus um me just uh, making the memorized passages or or go through studies together so and you know and then we have just spontaneous worship times in the home both my oldest daughters are amazing worship leaders. And so they just grab the guitar and, or jump on the piano and just from their heart, they're just crying out to God. And then pretty soon we're all around the piano or guitar and just like screaming out to God and just so happy as a family being in his presence. Thank you. That yeah. was really precious.
Um, I've got a bunch of toddlers in my home. Yeah. They don't always cooperate so well. Yeah. <laughs> um, you spoke, I always say recently, but I, I never know when the sermons <laughs> exactly are, but you've talked about um, people facing addiction and their accountability partner doesn't call them up mm. and they go right back to the mud, right? Mm. Referencing your own experience with temptation, you say, every time I started gravitating towards sin, I just felt dirty. I mm -hmm. couldn't live with myself because God did something to me. Yeah. And whenever I do, it grosses me out. It feels dark. There's no peace. For a man and woman who believes in God, but is thinking, I'm just never going to beat this. What more would you say by way of encouragement? And by the way, that whole talk you gave is just beautiful. And if you want to just repeat even what I just said. <laughs> yeah, well, I, yeah, that's a big concern of mine, because sometimes in the church, we're just about behavior modification. And we applaud someone that, you know, my, my concern is the person themselves. And, you know, the Bible says that all of us were slaves to sin. Um, all of us were following the enemy and just, just doing whatever our flesh wanted to do. But then it describes that when the spirit entered into us, then suddenly we became slaves to righteousness. Like, that's what I was trying to describe. Like, I just hungered for the right things and unlike a pig who runs back to the mud i would touch the mud and ah i'd still be tempted by the mud but i couldn't live in the mud anymore i i had to get out of that and i get concerned because for example like when our oldest was 12 she was just this compulsive liar and there came this point where my wife and i are like did we fail? And I remember telling her, I go, no. I said, I will not take that because everything I read in the scriptures is that I can't change her heart. I said, we could lock her in her room until she's 18 and keep her from doing anything wrong. We can set her schedule in such a way. But then once she turns 18, she's gone. She'll just do whatever she wants to do anyways. I said, our only hope is for the Holy Spirit himself to enter into her. And when that happens, then it's almost like our job is kind of done. She'll have these convictions. And it was really amazing because it was probably just a couple months later after me explaining to her that, honey, I am concerned because you do these things and I know you love me and you love mom, but I can't tell if you really love him, God, and you're doing things to please us. And I, I get concerned because I don't see the fruit of the spirit in your life, that it comes from a deep place within. And so anyways, we kind of went on for a couple months and then she eventually one day comes to me and said, dad, you were right. I was like, well, I don't know. I can't know a person. She goes, no, you were right. I didn't know God. The Holy Spirit was not in me. And I'm like, well, how can you be so sure? And she says, well, because he's in me now. She goes, dad, I talk to him like I'm talking to you. Like, like I know him now. So I know that I did not know him before. And so as a parent, you... You kind of like, well, we'll see. I didn't say that, but in my head, I'm thankful. But then sure enough, her entire life just does a 180. And so really was not about me and not about these rules I enforced on her. Um, but truly it was God changing her, which is the same thing that happened in my life. And there've been different experiences. Some of my younger ones, they experienced a relationship with the Holy Spirit at an early age. And it's, it's amazing. Um, even my six-year-old, just his dreams that he has and the way God speaks to him is like fascinating. And he has a faith that I, that I want. I mean, it's just so pure 
and he's having these encounters with God and you can't control those things. You can't, uh, you can't learn that in a classroom. It's a really different focus than managing behavior and watching triggers. Yeah. Focusing on getting the Holy Spirit in your life. Mm. Um, thank you. Yeah. As we've talked, you haven't shied away from unpopular um, ideas and questions. In a day when it's becoming harder and harder to speak plain truths that people don't want to hear, can you share your thoughts on, on what many fear is the erosion of freedom yeah. to share the message of Jesus and other unpopular ideas, not only around the world like Hong Kong, yeah, here in Western democracies. Yeah, I mean, this was this was prophesied. Um, you think about what Paul tells Timothy in in First and Second Timothy four verse three he says the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So Paul explains that there's a time coming when people will not, they, they just won't put up with sound teaching but they'll have itching ears. They, they'll find someone to tell them what they want to hear. So if I want to live, if I want to divorce my wife, I can find a teacher who'll tell me it's okay. You know, if I want to have a boyfriend and a girlfriend, you know, then I'll find someone who tells me it's okay. But it's, it's an itching ear that, that wants to find someone that suits their own passion. And so if you don't want to believe in a judgment day, then find someone that teaches that there's no judgment. Um, but it's, it's all about there's going to come a day when people won't just read the scriptures. Um, they'll find people who will tell them what they want to hear. But he says, as for you, always be sober minded. In other words, don't let that popularity influence you. Endure suffering do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So at the end of the day, you have to decide, you know, am I saying this because I think people like it and I'm going to get more likes and more followers? Or am I saying this because God called me to this and I'm doing uh, the work of an evangelist, fulfilling my ministry? I remember pretty early on, um, I was speaking at chapel in, at Pepperdine University and and they used to do this thing where you have chapel and then you can get credit for a second chapel if you go to the question and answer time and, and people will ask questions of the speaker. And, and I could read the body language at the school and, you know, people are laying down on the bleachers, this and that. And, but I remember afterwards during the Q&A, one of the gals asked, hey, everything you said about there being one way to heaven um, and you were pretty adamant about it. She goes, you know that most of us don't believe that and we're actually like offended that you would say that. So why would you say that? And I said, that's a great question. Um, but I wanna to explain to you, like I don't say things cause I think you'll like it. Um, I, I say things I don't even like. Um, but when I read the scriptures, I go, gosh, this is what God says. And so I'm bound by that. So I say something because to the best of my understanding, it's true and I'm called to say it. I'm not after popularity. Um, I'm after God saying, well done when this is all over. I believe you when you say that. Mm. And I want you to know, I, I, my gratitude is because of how you impacted my relationship with the Lord. So I know what you've said about celebrity culture and all that. So yeah. um, with all the debates around hard culture war, culture war issues and sexuality, you said something, I think this was a, 
older sermon because you looked a little younger. <laughs> <laughs> you said this, and I, I wish, I wish this could be everywhere. You said, when we begin an argument with, well, I wouldn't believe in a God who would, who would what? Do something you wouldn't do or think in a way that's different from the way you think. And you go on to caution everyone about jumping so quickly into the debates. Mm. And, and, and you kind of recenter it back and say, if you disagree with God on an issue, would you submit to him? At the core of your being, do you believe in a creator? If he is your creator, would you surrender to whatever he would ask you to do? I'd love if you say a little bit more about that, Pastor. Thank yeah. you, especially of the people caught up in some of the culture war issues, LGBT rights or, or anything else. And yeah, you know, they need to distance themselves from faith. Mm. Surrender is not easy for any of us, but what more would you say to someone having a difficult time mm. in some, some of these areas? Yeah, I, I think it would go to, um, it's kind of a big word, epistemology. You know, your the theory of knowledge, like how, why do you believe what you believe? Like, how do you know what's true? So, and I explain most people right now, they believe whatever they think or feel. If they have an opinion about something, then in their mind, that's true. Now, how they came to that opinion, was it because I felt it? Was it because I was raised in it? Um, you know, when I saw my mom, she was so good and, and she taught me this, so I'm going to go with it. And, uh, or I feel this in my heart. And, and so you got all these people believing different things. And I, I asked me, why do you bet on yourself? Is it, is it a matter of intellect? Like your IQ is so much higher than everyone else's that your opinion is right and theirs is wrong? Or is it your intimacy with God and the Holy Spirit? Because you're so humble, he pours his grace out on you. And so he's going to reveal truth to you because we believe all truth comes from him. And so why did he give it to you? Yeah, I mean, we have to ask these, these questions. Like, is it because I have this humble, contrite spirit um, am I closer to the Holy Spirit? Like, why do I know truth? And why is this person off? And I was just explained to a bunch of young people that there was a time in my life when I just thought I could go in my office and study and um, come up with the truth. But I realized a lot of times I would just find people from my theological background to you know, dispute uh, this weird teaching, you know, like, hey, you know, they believe in this, why don't you help me fix that? And, and, and so again, I'm just trusting this person who told me this thing. And I was explaining how my process has changed over the years where in the New Testament, there's so much about us, our Father who art in heaven. And there's something about the unity of the body, you know, like in, first, in Psalm 133, where he says that when the brothers are dwelling together in unity, there he commands his blessing, life forevermore. And I was telling them, you know, I, I look to the godliest people I know, who are the elders at our church, and I, and I know because I've seen the sacrifice, I've seen their heart, I've been with them through life. And if they collectively with me agree on something, I'm willing to bet a little more on that. And then I look through church history now and I go, gosh, there were people who lived in a time where they weren't so scattered in their thoughts. Their devotion was outrageous. They gave their lives for him. and they saw him, they walked with him. And here are the things they all say. So even if my little group of guys that I trust disagrees with that early church, I go, gosh, I, I don't know if I can bet on you guys. But if I am in agreement with these elders that I trust and these elders in, in agreement with that early church and church tradition, I go, I'll bet on that. Now you, 
I, I wouldn't bet on you. I don't bet on me. And I think I'm, you know, closer to God and more intelligent than you. And I won't bet on me. So why do you think, you know, it's just getting people to go and go. Just the weirdest thought of don't believe everything you think. Um, and be okay with people having different opinions. Someone recently said, uh, one of the shifts in our culture is people are no longer allowed to have opinions, um, but instead they are their opinions. And so if you reject their opinion, you're rejecting them rather than saying, no, I, I can reject what you think about that and still be committed to you and love you as a person yeah. um, to have disagreement. So it's just a strange time that we live in. Thank you, that was great. Um, I'm not gonna read the lead up to this question, except to, to quote Crazy Love, where you say, we want to put ourselves in situations where we are safe, even if there is no God. And this will be in the intro to the article about, you don't just say it, but you live this. Like you're speaking from your experience, moving to San Francisco, Hong Kong, like that kind of sacrifice feels really hard for many today, really scary. Like the rich young ruler, we stay away from the possibility, sorrowing, feeling it's too much. So compared to someone who's dedicated their life as a pastor, I'm sure many have wondered, do you really think God expects all of us to make sacrifices like that? Yeah. Yeah. Can God give us the 401ks so we don't have to? I'm sure you've yeah. heard about this. I'm, I'd love for you to share anything more. Gosh, my decisions, I don't think have anything to do with me being a pastor because I know many pastors who have no convictions the way I do. It's just, it's, it's what I read in scripture. Now, am I afraid each time I take a step of faith like that? Yeah, there's fear, um, but I'm more afraid to not obey. Um, I'm more afraid to be the rich young ruler that walks away sad and goes, ah, I, I, I want to be Zacchaeus who really sees the worth of Christ and just starts giving everything away. So it's, it, it's not even so much um, the suffering and suck it up and just give it away and faith. It's really just this clear picture of God and going, are you kidding me? I can know you. I can know you. I was made in your image. I was created in your image, the image of this triune God. And you say that you will abide in me and I'll abide in you. And the thought of ever not having that uh, is a lot more terrifying than how oh, I might be 70 and have to live in a tent. Uh, <laughs> you know, that doesn't scare me so much. Um, I just, it's, it's desire though. Zacchaeus, when you, you know, when, when uh, Jesus walks away from the rich young ruler, he says, it's just so hard for the rich. But then a few verses later, he runs into a very rich man, Zacchaeus, and it's completely different. Um, and Jesus says to Zacchaeus, today salvation has come into this house. Like he got a glimpse of Jesus, understood his worth, and was ready to give everything up, surrender. And Jesus, okay, salvation has come into this house. You get it. You understand what I'm worth. Um, and it, it's not like a downer passage. The downer passage is the rich young ruler. He walks away sad. Jesus is sad. Yeah. Zacchaeus, it just seems like Zacchaeus is beside himself, can't believe that Jesus would come into his home. And then Jesus is thrilled and is going, yeah, today salvation has come to this house. Awesome. Yeah. On your way back from Hong Kong, you shared an update where you said, that your family felt at perfect peace at a time when most people would be freaked out. 
That's a lot of what people are feeling, the freaked out part, not the peace part, mm-hmm. including lots of people who try to follow Jesus. There's enormous anxiety about the times we're living in. Um, mm-hmm. You've said in Crazy Love that worry implies we don't quite trust God is big enough, powerful enough, loving enough to take care of what's happening. I'd love if you could speak to believers who are just scared of so much that they're seeing happening in the world around them. What more you would say? Yeah, and again, I've had the privilege um, and the uh, advantage of walking with Jesus for the past 40 years. You know, as a kid who just was lost, no parents, no relationships really on the earth. I feel like no one cared about me. And then praying to the Jesus as I read about him in the scriptures and it, he just answered and answered and answered. So you're talking about 40 years of history where outrageous answers to prayer. So whatever happens in a day, I just go, no, he really does work all things together for the good. Um, This morning I woke up, I was pretty sick and I was just grateful. I go, God, this is great. You probably just want me to kick back in bed and cancel my appointments and spend some time with you. It's good. Let's do it. You know, and had a wonderful, wonderful time. You know, it's a silly, small thing, but everything that happens, I just go, I've seen this pattern for so long. It's like my own children. If dad does something, they know there's a reason. We've never seen him act like totally idiotic or, you know, irrational. Um, It's probably something I don't understand. And they've learned to trust and and say, gosh, dad, thanks. Thanks for not letting me do this. Thanks for, I mean, you know, thanks for this decision, that decision. I see why you did all these things. And that's why I feel about the Lord. It's so COVID doesn't scare me. I mean, and if, um, even this morning I was thinking, gosh, if something happened to one of my kids, of course it'd be painful. Um, and you know, it's every parent's nightmare. But at the same time, I was just thanking the Lord this morning, like, God, I feel like I can get through anything with you because you've always been so good to me. And there's always been a reason for everything you do. Um, but again, that comes from a lifetime of answered prayer. And, and so maybe there was some faith in the beginning. Um, But over time, it just seemed like it would take more faith not to trust him because of the way he's interacted with me my whole life. I I don't even know what I would do. Um, It it just doesn't make any logical sense to me that God's not been listening to me. Awesome. Um, This is great. (laughs) I'm gonna combine two questions. Okay. Since we're getting near the end. Yeah. It does seem to many like like it's harder to follow Jesus now than ever. But you said um, to in a message to Brazil, I've never appreciated and loved being a follower of Christ more than right now. Mm. As you just spoke to, just to know I can be secure in him. One thing Monique and I have appreciated about your your teaching is you have so much joy. (laughs) You know, I have an agnostic coworker and I was telling her I was interviewing you and she doesn't believe any of this, but nobody can deny the real joy, right? And that it's strange. Like people don't have this today. You You don't walk around the street and see this. So, this is kind of a, a, a an abstract question, but um, what, what, what would it take for more believers to find this kind of joy and peace, yeah. even with the stuff kind of falling down around us? That's, yeah. just, that's a message that, 
that is really exciting. Yeah. Well, like I mentioned earlier, you know, like Peter says, we rejoice with joy inexpressible. Like we just feel like everything in us just wants to scream. Like that's how I was feeling this morning alone with the Lord. Like, ah, oh, this is this is too much. Why me? Why do I get this? Um, and it's not, oh, because my family is nice. This is this, you know, it's just, I know God. He listens to me. He's been with me for all of these years. And so I do have this joy that at times is is inexpressible. I remember one time in the airplane just reading the scriptures and I I begin to tear up just so happy. And uh, I remember the flight attendant is like, are you okay? And I, I feel bad because I said, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm fine. And there's part of me that didn't want to say like, no, I've just been reading the Bible and I'm so just freaked out, excited of what I have in Christ. Um, I mean, the Bible says that's a fruit of the spirit. Um, and I want people to understand this was not me at all. You know, there's some people that have like a natural disposition. It seems like that they're happier people. Um, but if you ask any of my family that knew me as a kid, it was just, I was the most unhappy person. I, I remember just few, you know, every time I'd see my aunt, she would say, why are you never happy? You know, and I'm like, I don't know, you know, and my dad would just comment, you know, on just like, I always had this scowl. And, but when I began to understand the grace of God, and so I, I was raised in a very like, um, typical Asian home that was very performance centered and shame driven and uh had no relationship with my dad he, only when he scolded me and um and so all i knew of a father was someone that was always disappointed in me um where i never measured up wasn't as smart as my sister wasn't as gifted you know doing things as my brother i was just I was just kind of loser and it's my fault that his wife died because she gave birth to me and then she died. And it's just, so you just grow up like this rejected, unhappy person. And it was a wrestle for me when I would read the passages about the grace of God and the love of God. Um, just because I had never experienced that from a father. And so it took time and I probably still have some baggage from all of that. But over the years, um, the spirit really has changed me where I understand I'm not trying to earn his favor. Mm. It was like, while we were enemies, Christ died for us. And so if I keep striving to get his approval somehow, uh, it shows that I don't really believe that this is a free gift, mm -hmm. this salvation. And I don't really believe his words of life and that he came to give me life to the full. And so as I began to see those flaws in my theology, I began to believe and accept and enjoy. Um, so for some of you that maybe aren't, experiencing that joy which he says is a, a fruit of the spirit um just like a good tree will produce good fruit you know it's like if apples aren't showing up are you sure you're an apple tree it's just are you sure you know him are you sure that he lives in you dwells in you has changed you this is what i say to so many people because there's a promise if we're talking about Almighty God, he doesn't just enter you and change nothing. And you don't have love, joy, peace, patience, kind. That, that doesn't, it's not the God that I read about in scripture, but it's his transforming power where it's not fake because we've all been around people that put on a fake smile and go, hey, how are you, brother? It's, uh, 
And you know those where oh, the person really knows God yeah. and loves God and is thrilled. You know, it's, it's just like in human relationships, you can tell when someone is really in love with their wife or their kid, or even to the point where it's obsessive. Um, and those that just really aren't that into them. And I just see too much of that in religion nowadays. Thank you. You've got a hard stop at the top of the hour, right? Yeah. Yeah. My wife wanted to come on and say hello in a minute or two, if that's okay. Yeah. What's her name? Monique. Monique, Monique, Monique. Okay. Um, so I'm going to try to fit in two more questions. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We'll do it. People like to mock this idea that people who actually believe Jesus is coming to earth again, but that's something I, I, you know, heard you teach. Do you feel yourself that his coming is getting closer? And what do you anticipate people trying to follow him having to get through before that wonderful day comes? Hmm. Yeah, I think 2 Timothy 3 really sums all of that up. And, you know, Jesus explained that, look, when, when the Son of Man returns, it's going to be like the days of Noah, where everyone is just doing their thing. And then the flood comes, and they just never believed it. I mean, unfortunately, we're going to have to be like Noah's that are ridiculed by everyone. And, uh, you know, in 2 Timothy 3, he explains that, you know, verse one, understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power avoid such people. So it's, it's not just saying that this is going to happen in the world, but he says this is actually going to happen in the church too, um, where people will be loving themselves, loving money, loving pleasure. And so you just realize, okay, that's, that's what we're up against. That's exactly where we are. And now we have churches that are even trying to appeal to people through earthly pleasure. And um, yeah. Meanwhile, again, he's warning Timothy, don't, don't give into that, you know, flee from all of that and live the way that God's called you to. Thank you. I'm going to let her in for the last question. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> so we were both touched by your recent video on unity and silence as a way to draw hearts together. Mm -hmm while recognizing the real theological differences that will continue, including how we see Jesus to some degree, do you think there are more opportunities for unity and collaboration between Latter-day Saints and evangelicals as we look ahead to more troubled times in the world? Mm -hmm. And as a part of that, I'm sure people would be curious whether you visited Utah and have any friendships yeah. with Latter-day Saint neighbors or leaders. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've been to Utah several times and, you know, I was actually had some real close friends in college, played on volleyball team together um, that were LDS. And, um, and as far as your question, like what, I mean, there's certainly things that we can partner on um, because, you know, the, you know, the sanctity of life. Um, God's creation of male and female. Um, there's certainly things we agree upon. Living in a country where there's freedom. Um, I just think it's one of those things where people have to be okay with discussion and for there to be love um, in that discussion. Uh, you know, for me, there's some of those differences uh, are so deep. Um, like, I don't know how to reconcile, you know, when I, because, you know, we, I read the Old Testament, New Testament, just over and over and over. Our, our church reads the entire Bible every year. 
And so you just have this mindset of, I want to know what God is like. What was, what's he been like for these thousands of years? And, and so there's like this, oh, there's this, oh, there's, there's no one like him. There's, there's no other one like him. And so, so when we hear a doctrine, when people like me hear a doctrine, like, no, actually there, you can become like him. And there's, you know, it's like, whoa, it's very, very hard to stomach. Um, and, you know, if I'm honest, it, it, in my soul, it, it, it feels blasphemous, you know, like, ah, oh, no, there's one and we bow before him and surrender to him. And, and so to have discussions over that, I can do that, you know, and be honest and go, gosh, I, I've got to throw away so much. And, and, uh, you know, for everyone to come to the table and go, look, I, I'll ditch everything for truth and I will follow truth wherever it leads me. Um, I've already been rejected by my old camp just for embracing, not even embracing, just having conversation um, with people who are more charismatic or, or more Catholic. Um, so the whole cancel thing, been there, done that. Um, I, and I'm too old to just believe something because it's the way I was taught. And as long as we're really seeking truth and being honest with each other in those discussions, we don't pretend, oh, everything's this fine. Um, but to say, yeah, we can agree on the tragedy in Afghanistan and watching people fly in, off of a plane and, and how can we get food to these people and um, people in civil war in Ethiopia and starving to death and how do we yeah. do something there i mean i can partner with oprah on that i don't care you know it's there's um but we have to be realistic um and honest and that doesn't mean that unity is you know like we can unite on certain things right sure so sure. yeah well, thank you for your time monique are you I want there? to see you monique are you there yeah. Hi. <laughs> I'm hiding in my kid's room so I can right. find a quiet place. <laughs> yeah, I've I've done that many times. I recognize that scene. <laughs> bunk beds. Monique and I have watched a lot of your vi videos. It's almost scandalous, probably maybe scandalous to our neighbors how much of Francis Chan we watch on Sabbath. <laughs> she wanted so, to yeah. express her thanks as well. 